Father, I want us to be swallowed up in this song. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. Christ, I pray.
Hello everyone and welcome to our Grace Point live stream. My name is John and I am one of the ministry workers here and I'll be leading the service for today. Let me welcome you as you worship with us, whether you are joining with us in the morning or in the evening, whether you are joining with us online in your community groups or with your families or whether you are regular or whether this is your first time tuning in, welcome. But before we get started, I just want to point out for those of you who are tuning in that our bulletin can be found at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash bulletin and the sermon outline can be found at gracepoint.org.au slash sermon and if you want to get connected with us online and join a community group our connection card can be found at gracepoint.org.au slash connect now if you didn't catch anything of what I just said then if you are tuning in to the live stream via Facebook or online church, then our online hosts would have also posted up those links for the bulletin and the sermon down at the live chat on the right hand side of your screen right here. Okay? Now, today is a very special day for a number of reasons and I'm going to quickly make a mention of. Firstly, today is the first Sunday that we have actually launched our Small Spaces initiative. And that is exciting because groups all around our city are meeting together for worship, community, and mission. And it's a wonderful opportunity for many of you who haven't been able to serve for quite some time since the onset of social distancing restrictions. And so now you get to participate in serving one another through the reading of God's word, through prayer, and in music as you gather together around the live stream. Now, once again, I do want to extend this invitation to any newcomers and those joining us online that small spaces is an opportunity for you to join a small group that's meeting around the live stream. And this will give you the chance to meet with others and to be part of our church community. And so if you are interested in that, if you want to join a small space on Sunday that is within your local area, you can register at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash small spaces. If you didn't catch it, I'm going to repeat it. It is at gracepoint.org.au slash go slash small spaces. Okay? Got it? Very nice. Another special occasion that I want to make mention of is that today so happens to be Father's Day. And so I just want to take some time to give a shout out to all our fathers at Grace Point who are currently raising children. And we want to wish all of your families that will celebrate you for your hard work in raising and 
leading your own households. Now, here's a tip from me for all you kids out there or anyone that has a father. If you still haven't gotten anything for your father yet on Father's Day and you're looking to get them a gift, might I suggest for you to just walk down the street, the corner, go to your nearest KFC outlet and get them 15 Wicked Wings for $15, okay? That's a Father's Day gift for less than $20. What a bargain. That's my tip of the week. Now, I also want to acknowledge the father-to-be's. I'm thinking of one particular group, community group member, a lead, I should say, whose baby daughter is going to arrive in about two weeks or two or three weeks. Shout out to you, Jai, my brother. And I also want to acknowledge all the single fathers out there, or those who long to be fathers, but for some particular reason, it's not become a reality for them yet, or even for those who have lost their fathers already. You know that Father's Day is not often a day of celebration for you, but a day of grief. And so we just want to say that our thoughts and prayers are with you as well. And speaking of fathers, every single Sunday, we give praise and worship to our Heavenly Father. It's the reason why all of you are here and the reason why all of you are tuning online now on live stream. We meet together within our smaller gatherings at home on the Lord's Day to sing songs of praise to His name. We sit under the teaching of His Word, surrendering our lives to His will, and we also meet together to serve one another with our God-given gifts in order to grow in our unity in Christ. Let me just kick off by reading a passage from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. It says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Many of us are weary and burdened from the circumstances we are in, and so let us come to God in prayer, asking Him that He will give us rest for our souls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Jesus. We thank Him for the humility and holiness in which He has lived and died. And we want to praise You that He has freed us from our sin and that He has comforted us and strengthens us through our struggles. And He gives us courage to follow Him. And through Him, we are able to have the rest that brings life to our souls. And so as we gather together, would you please renew us and strengthen us, enrich us with your spirit and stir us with greater faith that we might sing joyfully your name to all the earth. We pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Our music team is going to lead us in worship. Let's stand and sing praises to our great God.
Jesus erhalten. Hi, my name is Josh. I'm one of the regulars from Burwood Evening Service. I'll be leading us in praying today. So please join me as we come to God in prayer as a church community. Starting with Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voices. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the break of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statues, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. Lord, we praise you. You are holy. You are sovereign above all things. There is nothing none like you who deserve all glory and praise as the creator of this world. We give thanks for the privilege of worship this morning, knowing how inadequate we are compared to you. None of us can claim to have clean hands or kept our hearts pure. Yet out of your infinite mercy, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that we may be reconciled with you. We were once your enemies, but now we are forgiven and live as your sons and daughters. We pray for the leaders around the world, Lord. We know there is no authority except that which you have established. So we pray for the hearts and minds of these leaders. May you grant them wisdom and faithfulness as they seek to govern your creation through the complexities of this world. Rather than using their position for personal gains and power, we pray they will first and foremost strive to discharge their duties faithfully, 
surround them with like-minded, Christ-loving people as they pursue peace and for the greater good of the citizens under their charge. Lord, we pray for our leaders at church and the leaders of various ministries. In the face of great uncertainty and having to juggle with multiple needs across the community, please grant them the fortitude and provide them with rest. Many of them feel drained and stretched. Please sustain them physically and spiritually. We pray as they serve our fellow brothers and sisters at church, that we do so holding on to the unchanging and unfailing promise of Jesus, knowing his yoke is light and easy, and he grants rest to all those who come to him feeling weary and burdened. We pray for us as individuals of this church. Although COVID-19 has drastically changed the way we do worship and we do life as a community, we pray you will uphold us and not to give up in meeting each other regularly, but also to continue to outwardly look for evangelistic opportunities around us. Strengthen us as different parts of the same body to remain united and focused, to love Jesus, to love each other in the community, and to love our city and the world as his witness. Open our ears so that we can hear your call and open our hearts too, so we can carry out your instructions boldly and selflessly. In your son's most precious name, amen. Everyone, it is time to reveal our catechism of the week. For those of you who do not know what the word catechism means, the word catechize simply means to teach biblical truth in an orderly way. And the catechisms are typically structured in a question and answer format. And so today's catechism comes from the Heidelberg Catechism question 37. And here is what it says. What do you confess when you say that he suffered? Answer. During all the time he lived on earth, but especially at the end, Christ bore in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. Thus, by his suffering, as the only atoning sacrifice, he has redeemed our body and soul from everlasting damnation and obtained for us the grace of God, righteousness, and eternal life. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 to 8 says that Christ made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And in these two verses that I've just said there, there we can make a distinction of two elements of Christ's suffering. Okay, The first one, the first element is the most understated one one of Christ's sufferings is the fact that he laid aside his divine privileges as sovereign rule of the universe in order to take on human flesh. I think many of us probably don't recognize how humiliating it was for Jesus to assume human flesh. But when we begin to see that Jesus did not need to come down, right? In his power, he could have chosen to just chillax and not mingle with sinful human beings. But he took on human flesh, flesh that was weak and true to the fall, flesh that is subject to pain and death. That indeed is a form of suffering for Christ. But the second element, which is the most significant element of Christ's suffering, is that he humbled himself to dying on the cross for the sins of the world. His sacrifice atoned for our sin, and he enables us to attain eternal life for, with our Heavenly Father. And we can receive these divine blessings through faith in the Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing enough that we should recite it all together as a unified body of believers. Am I right? Church, let me ask you the question. And you can respond by reading the answer aloud along with me. Question 37. What do you confess when you say that he suffered? Answer. During all the time he lived on earth, but especially at the end, Christ bore in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. Thus, by his suffering, as the only atoning sacrifice, he has redeemed our body and soul from everlasting temptation and obtained for us the grace of God, righteousness, and eternal life. I'll also be doing the Bible reading for us. And the passage comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
verses 13 to 18. So that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And as I give you guys time to flick through to the passage, I just want to make mention that we read God's word together because God has revealed himself to his people by his word. God sent his word down to us so that we might know who he is for our good and for our joy and for his glory. And so we're going to hear from what God has to say to us this morning and this evening with open hearts ready to receive and to be nourished with what he has to say to us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 to 18, let me read it. Brothers, sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed by those who sleep in debt, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fall, fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good day, everyone. Uh, let me invite you to leave your Bibles open and uh, keep your bulletins ready as we dive deep into God's word. I'm going to pray for us and ask God uh, to open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive from him. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather today uh, to worship together um, in some small spaces, to gather together, maybe for the first time in a long time, uh, but chiefly to be able to hear your voice. Lord, many of us come today feeling like we are just barely holding on or many of us are feeling fatigued and exhausted where we feel like if there's just one more change, then I, I'm over it. We thank you, God, that you have come for people just like us who are exhausted, who are tired, who are helpless. Lord, help us to see ourselves the way you do, but help us to see what you've come to do for us. We thank you for the hope, the security, and the joy that you bring and I ask, dear Lord, that our eyes will be lifted up to you and strengthened by the truths we have here in Scripture. We commit these things to you. We ask you to lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in some ways, COVID has changed everything about how we live. And in many other ways, COVID has changed absolutely nothing. Isn't that right? How has COVID changed the way we live? Well, I don't know about you, but I've never been more diligent in reading the news every single day. I check the news for the weather. I check the news for latest updates. And then I check for transmission rates. I check for new government guidelines. I check to see which mall I can go shopping. What's more, I've used more hand sanitizer in the past six months that I have in my entire life. And at the same time, I've used more hand moisturizer in the past six months than I have in my entire life just to offset the dryness. But this transcends the trivial, doesn't it? I know that many of you have lost jobs. Many of you have suffered reduced hours. Many of you haven't been able to see family for an extremely long time. Life is not the same anymore. Some of you are kept up at night because someone you know is ill or at risk. You might, like, uh, might be like me, you know, others who had to shut down businesses, sell homes, stand in line for government assistance because absolutely everything has changed. But in other ways, COVID hasn't changed anything as well, hasn't it? Because life is still fragile, every day is still a gift, and the chance of death for every human being is still 100%. 
So in these circumstances, all COVID has done is that it has stripped us away of our confidence in money and medicine and materialism and has revealed to us the invisible threat of death. You see, we have always been surrounded by death. It's just that in Australia, we are largely guarded from the ugliness of death and shielded from its threats. For example, when someone passes away, we put these corpses in body bags as opposed to letting them lie in the streets to rot. When there is an open casket at a funeral, we realize that there is actually an entire industry committed to make dead people look more alive. And when there's a cremation, all we see is a wooden box moving into fiery flames. It's clean. It's, it's quite sanitized. Death rarely stares at us in the face. But COVID has lifted the veil, hasn't it? Because you see, COVID doesn't just mean, aha, now people will die. No, people have always been threatened by death. It's just that with COVID, we now realize, I might die. My loved ones might die. I am not as invincible or immortal as I thought. No amount of vitamins, hand sanitizers, face masks, antibacterial wipes will make me 100% immune. Death is personal now. And so really, nothing has changed. It's just that what we once worked hard to ignore, to deny, to distract ourselves of is right now in our faces. Have you realized? Every sneeze, every itchy throat, every runny nose, every slight change of body temperature is reminding us that the threat of death, though invisible, is real and right here. How do we face the invisible threat of death? This is what the Apostle Paul is concerned with in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Now, for context, the question that the Thessalonian believers were asking is, will those who have died still witness the return of Jesus Christ? Will those who have died still witness the return of Jesus Christ? You see, the Apostle Paul speaks about the glory of Christ's return in passages like 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 19, just a few chapters before this. We are told that this will be a joyous event, one that surpasses all of our imaginations. And so there was a concern that those who had passed away would be disadvantaged when Christ did return, that they worried that they would miss out on this amazing event. Missing out. Our modern-day concerns aren't so different, are they? Because what frightens us about death is not so much death itself, though that is scary. Many are worried perhaps more about the process of dying. That's what I hear. But what we're arguably most worried about is the way that death robs us of experiences and opportunities. Death is the ultimate reason we miss out on things. Through death, all of our dreams, aspirations, desires, they all crumble apart and this scares us. How do we face that which creeps at our very doorstep right now? If you have your outlines available, you'll see that Paul exhorts us from our text today to number one, endure with hope, number two, expect with excitement, and number three, encourage with truth. Endure with hope, expect with excitement, and encourage with truth. And what we discover is that Paul is trying to communicate the single truth that because Jesus is coming back again, everything is going to be okay. Because Jesus is coming back again, everything is going to be okay. Come with me to point one, and we read from verses 13 to 15. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. In these verses, Paul teaches us to endure with He does this firstly by explaining the reality of death. The reality of death. Notice how Paul describes death in verse 13. Paul states he is writing to inform them about those who sleep in 
death. Underline that phrase if you have your own Bibles in front of you because this reveals something so crucial about what death really is. If you have other English translations of the Bible, you might see that the word death is actually absent. It's not there. Instead, the word asleep is used. You see, Paul has actually used the word asleep as a synonym or a substitute for the word death. The NIV translation has added the word death in there so that we know exactly what Paul is trying to say. But in actual fact, Paul has only used the word asleep. Now, why? Well, firstly, it is because the religious and non-religious of his day often spoke of death as sleep. You could say it was a euphemism. It was a way to speak about death without it being too scary. In religious literature, uh, in the Bible, we turn to passages like Genesis 47 verse 30, Deuteronomy 31 verse 16, Isaiah 14 verse 8. These are all in your outlines. But there are also extra biblical works like 2 Maccabees 12 verse 45, 1 Enoch, and others. And these works describe the dead as those who fall asleep. In non-religious literature, uh, those of you who are ancient history buffs, you know that uh, Homer's Iliad, Sophocles' Electra, and other Greek and Latin inscriptions similarly describe the deceased as those who sleep. It was a universal way of saying those who have died. And it makes sense, doesn't it? If you think about it, death is actually a very profound concept. Uh, how do you explain it? Like when a five-year-old goes up to his mom and says, Mommy, what happened to my goldfish? It's not moving anymore. It's turned upside down. What's going on? What does mom say? Honey, your goldfish is dead. Now, if the son understands, then, oh, no, what's going to happen? But chances are the five-year-old is going to go, what does that mean, Mommy? What does it mean that my goldfish is dead? The best thing mom can probably say at this point or maybe dad, since his father's dead, that seems more appropriate. You know, son, honey, your goldfish is asleep. Now let's flush him down the toilet so you can sleep with all the other happy goldfishes and we'll buy you one that's awake. Is that the best way to describe death? Well, maybe for those who find it hard to grasp. It's appropriate, isn't it? Everyone would have understood what Paul meant. It was a polite way of speaking of death. It was a common alternative to speak about death. That's only the first reason. But secondly, and more importantly, Paul used the word sleep instead of death because he had an insight into a deeper reality. He had insight into a deeper reality. Because while the word sleep was a common euphemism for death, Paul also knew biblically and theologically that physical death is not the end. By informing the Thessalonian believers about those who are asleep, Paul is implying and anticipating a future awakening, a future resurrection that is spoken of in the Old Testament and secured through the work of Jesus Christ. You see, church, for the world, death is the end of something good. But for the Christian, death is the beginning of something even better. Because in our death, we await the resurrection that Jesus will bring at His return. Therefore, Paul knew that just as sleep is not a permanent state, so too death is not a permanent state. So church, we endure by realizing a deeper reality of death, that death is not the end. Nevertheless, despite the reality of death, Paul still recognizes the pain of loss the pain of death, which is why in verse 13, he tells them, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Notice this. Paul doesn't say, so that you do not grieve, full stop. He says, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, like the rest of humanity. Church, the Holy Scriptures is actually inviting us to recognize our emotions. To recognize our emotions. To grieve when it is necessary. Can you believe that? 
Healthy spirituality is to have our emotions formed and normed by God's Word. And so we are actually rightly to rejoice and celebrate and to be happy over things that brings God delight. But we are also to grieve, lament, and cry over things that break God's heart. And death, brothers and sisters, breaks God's heart. The shortest verse in the Bible is John 11, verse 35. If you have your kids at home, they probably know what it is. And if you're looking for a short verse to remember this week, let this be it. John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. Two simple words. And this was Jesus' action as he stood before the tomb of Lazarus, who had already been dead for four days. And death breaks God's heart because death is a consequence of living in a broken and sinful world. Death shows that this world in its current state is not what it was meant to be. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us to suppress our emotions and pretend like they're not there. And so although Christians have a different view of death, although we have a deeper insight into the reality of death, that death is not the end, here we are nevertheless invited to grieve the presence of death. This is so appropriate for us, isn't it? Because, see, we live in a world that treats death true trivially. Quite frankly, our world is embarrassed by death. And so what do we do? We dismiss death as quickly as we can. And in doing so, we often do great injustice to the family and friends of the deceased who actually need the space to grieve. I recently heard um, of a funeral that was called a celebration party to celebrate the life of the person who had just died. And there's a part of me that is very sympathetic to that, right? Because even from a Christian perspective, we can rightly celebrate a person's life and give thanks to God. That's totally right and fine. But the issue with this so-called celebration party is that the organizers wanted to avoid all the doom and gloom associated with funerals. And so pretty colors were used instead of just somber black. Loud party music was used instead of maybe typical hymns you would hear. Drinks, food, and dance were replaced with quietness and reflection. This whole thing was a distraction. It was a distraction from the truth that death is painful. And church, when we take away God and eternity out of the picture, then the only hope we have for death is distraction or an attempt to explain it away. Yet you see, Grace Point, part of our endurance as Christians is actually to grieve. To rightly respond to the brokenness in our world and to cry out when it is right. Death, although it's not the end, is real loss. And so church, we learn to grieve. If you've ever experienced the loss of a loved one, then take the time you need to process your emotions. Bring them before God. Grieve before Him. Cry out to Him. It almost feels weird that you need to be given permission to do this, right? But I think as your pastor, it's necessary for me to say this because God's Word says it. But also because sometimes we can make biblical truth and human emotion two sides of the spectrum as if they're against each other. As if if you believe that death is not the end, then you shouldn't grieve at all. That's far from the truth, isn't it? No, we recognize our emotions. But we do not let our emotions control us. We do not let our emotions control controls which is why verse 13 continues that we are to grieve but not like the rest of humanity who have no hope church truth shapes our emotions what is the foundation for this hope what is our resource well verse 14 and 15 tell us it is magnificent truth that Jesus died for our sins to forgive us of our transgressions against God. And what's more, Jesus Christ rose again so that you and I may have new life in Him. 
so that through Jesus Christ, all who believe in Him, all who confess that they are more broken than they dare to admit, yet more loved than they dare dream, all who trust in Him as Lord and Savior will be raised with Him. This is what keeps us going. The reality that a future resurrection is coming. After all, if the threat is death, then the remedy has to be resurrection, the reversal of death. And so this hope for believers, that death is not the end, but an entry into something even better, is what enables us to grieve without our lives falling apart. This future resurrection allows us to grieve without our lives falling apart. Jesus allows us to see death for what it really is. Painful, but not permanent. In verse 15, Paul instructs the Thessalonian believers that no one will miss out on this resurrection. It doesn't matter if they've fallen asleep already or whether they remain alive when Christ returns. This is a cosmic event, verse 15 says, that nobody will miss. And so Grace Point, endure with hope by realizing what death really is. By recognizing our emotions and grieving the state of this world, but also drinking from this resource of endurance, the hope of the resurrection. Because Jesus is coming back again, everything is going to be okay. But more than that, we are to expect with excitement. Come with me to verses 16 to 17. It reads, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. We are called here to expect with excitement. Now, before we go any further, church, can we just agree that what we've just read in these verses is like a scene out of an epic fantasy adventure film like Lord of the Rings? The image is remarkably vivid, isn't it? We have the Lord descending from heaven. We have an archangel. We have a loud trumpet. We have a resurrection. We have what looks like people being beamed up to heaven, the kind of you see in Marvel films, right? What's going on? It sounds remarkably exciting. And that's the point. It is. In the face of the invisible threat of death, God's Word is telling us to expect with excitement because something great is going to happen. Paul briefly introduced the theme of resurrection in verses 13 to 15, and now he expands this in greater detail, telling us how it will happen. And this great eschatological event is basically characterized by three movements. Three movements. This is again the outlines. Coming down, moving up, and meeting together. Coming down, which is speaking of Christ's descent. Moving up, which is speaking about the resurrection of the dead. And meeting together, which is speaking about the way we will welcome our Lord back to earth. Verse 16 begins by telling us the way that Jesus will return. He is coming down from heaven. But this is accompanied with three loud noises. The first is a command. The second is the voice of the archangel. And the third is the trumpet of God. Now, before we explore the theological significance of each of these noises, what we have to first pause and recognize is that this combination of command, voice, and trumpet sounds mirrors another very familiar event to Paul's early readers. Because in ancient times, the arrival of a high-ranking officer was very similar. The arriving of a high-ranking officer is also very similar. For example, if a governor of a province was going to visit a city, a loud command would be given. After that, you would hear the voice of his representatives or his entourage, his representatives as they accompany him into that city, into that journey. You see, important people don't travel alone. They travel with a group of people. 
And after this loud command, this noise, musical instruments like trumpets would also be used to drum it up to make a really big deal about their visit as they process toward the city. And so, Paul's first readers were familiar with this combination of command, voice, and trumpet. They knew it means that someone important is on his way. It was a social convention for the arrival of a significant figure. Paul is actually using common experience to illustrate an even more powerful reality. Because you see, our passage tells us the first sound is a loud command. It's a kind of warning shout designed to arouse everyone's attention. The second voice is the voice of the archangel. Now, we don't know exactly who this archangel is. It could be the archangel Michael, whom we introduced to in Jude 9. It could be Gabriel, who was introduced in Luke 1 verse 19. But the identity of the archangel is not as important as what it indicates. The archangel is joining in with the loud command to say something big is happening. The third loud noise is the trumpet of God. Why trumpet? Well, if you read parts of the Old Testament, which many of you have, then there are passages that speak of the trumpet being associated with divine activity. Exodus 19 verse 16 is an example of that. In other words, when you hear the trumpet, you know that God is going to do something. But then, there are passages like Matthew verses 31, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52, These again are in your passages, are in your outlines, and they make it clear that a loud trumpet call is connected to the return of Jesus Christ. Church, the one who is coming is not just an important official or a military victor. No, it is Jesus, the eternal Son of God, coming back, coming down from heaven, a descent. There's another movement. The end of verse 16 tells us that when Jesus descends, the dead in Christ will rise first. This is an action of moving up, a resurrection. This addresses the Thessalonian believers' concern. Because here, Paul is saying, those who have trusted in Jesus and died will not miss out on this glorious event. If anything at all, they will have a place of privilege in welcoming the return of the King. And there's a third movement. Verse 17 tells us that those who are still alive will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. To understand this, you probably have to pay close attention now. We need to return to the image of the coming of a high-ranking official. Come back to the image we talked about just earlier. Because you see, in ancient times, when important officials were on their way to visit your city, It was actually custom to meet these important people outside the city gates to welcome them. Instead of waiting for them to come into the city, if they were important, you will go outside the city to meet with them and then walk with them or escort them back into your city. This church was an expression of honor. We have very few parallels to this custom today, but I think we understand the principle, right? Someone important is coming, and so we go out of our way to meet with them first and welcome them back in. And here's the thing with this custom. There's a particular rule. The more important a person is, the further you go to welcome them. The more important a person is, the further out you go to welcome them. So, for example, if it was just a regular governor, you might meet him outside the city gate. This would have been quite a degree of honor already. But if you were someone of a higher rank, you might go 10 kilometers outside of the city gate to welcome them. If it is an even higher rank, you might go 50 kilometers and so on and so forth. It's based on how important this person is. The further you go to welcome the higher degree of respect you are showing. Interestingly, if you turn to passages like Acts 28 verse 15, we see this sort of practice. 
when Paul and his companions were approaching the imperial city, groups of people heard they were arriving and they traveled, and I quote, as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. They went far out. This was quite a distance to show how much they treasured Paul, how much they treasured his ministry and his companions. Have that picture in your mind right now because here's the thing. Jesus Christ is returning. The eternal high king of heaven who is reestablishing the new heavens and a new earth is returning. He is coming from heaven and verse 17 is almost like saying, no amount of ground is enough to travel to welcome this great king. We could go to the ends of the earth and it wouldn't even be enough. We got to go upwards to make sure that we welcome this returning king right. This, of course, is also appropriate given that heaven up there is where he is coming from. That's what it means that we will be caught up with the resurrected in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The expression to meet here is actually a technical term to say an official welcome of a newly arrived dignitary. Just as people would travel out to welcome someone important back, so too will believers alive and dead go up into the clouds to welcome our Savior and Redeemer back to earth where He will bring about a renewal of all creation. There will be a celebration, joy, songs, a warm reception because Jesus has come back and everything will be okay. This church will be the time when we'll be with the Lord forever. This church is the long-awaited Revelation 21 moment, isn't it? You and I are familiar with this. We memorize this because we need this truth every day, right? Let me read it for us. Revelation 21, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice before the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. There will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. Church, listen closely once again because Jesus is coming back. Everything's gonna be okay. And so we expect with excitement. History is moving towards this direction, the return of Jesus Christ, our King. Therefore, while afflictions, fears, and troubles may characterize our time together, while the invisible threat of death looms over each and every one of us, we need not be afraid. Something great is coming. We fix our eyes on this. This is critical, isn't it? what we expect, what we hope for, changes our view of life. Why is it that we live in an age where we have greater health care, greater entertainment, greater education, greater stability, greater access to almost anything we want, and yet we still feel more destitute, more hopeless, more joyless than before? My dear friends, if we see medicine as a remedy to the invisible threat of death, then it should be no surprise that we are feeling hopeless right now. Because vaccine or not, surgery or not, chemotherapy or not, pardon my bluntness, cannot avoid the inevitable coming of death. Medicine is such a wonderful gift to humanity, right? My parents themselves have had their lives preserved by good surgeons and good specialists. But medicine, as important as it is, is not the solution to humanity's ailment. If we see politics or economic growth as the remedy to the invisible threat of death, then it should be no surprise that we are all feeling hopeless right now. Because if our politicians were the remedy, then citizens of Western democracy who are supposedly more advanced than anyone should be immune to death. And yet we're not. If they, these things are the remedy, if economics is the remedy, then the wealthy 1% should be able to exchange every dollar for an extra second on earth. And yet they can't. You and I know that 
all this does maybe is delay the inevitable, but it's coming anyway. Friends, brothers and sisters, the only hope we have in the face of the invisible threat of death is Jesus Christ, who has come to forgive us of our sins, to restore and to repair our severed relationship with God, to teach us how to live, but more importantly, to give us new life. Believe in Him and everything will be okay. Nothing will be a threat to your sense of stability or security. And so we expect with excitement. Lastly, we come to point three, and we we read verse 18. This is short. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage with truth. Remember I said earlier that the Bible gives us permission to grieve. That is certainly true, right? Yet the trouble is, more often than not, we can very easily allow our emotions to govern us, allow our emotions to rule over our lives. It's a temptation to be disconnected from emotions, but it's also a temptation to allow our emotions to just drive everything that we do, feel, and believe. And true, sometimes grief can so overwhelm us that we see the world through the lens of grief and nothing else. That's why verse 13 says that our hope has to shape our grief. And our hope is shaped by the truth of Jesus Christ's return. This is why to wrap up chapter 4, Paul tells the Thessalonian believers and us to encourage one another with this truth. The expression, these words in our verse, refer to everything that Paul has been speaking about up to this point. And the word encourage doesn't just mean to exhort. It doesn't just mean to keep pressing, keep reminding. But in verse 18, it means more like to console, to comfort, and comfort with these truths. So encourage, exhort, but also to comfort and console with the truth of Christ's return. After all, this is what we need, isn't it? Paul's words are the source of continual strength. It tells us that God is supreme. Nothing is out of His control. And even death, our greatest enemy, will be, has been defeated. Jesus is triumphant. Encourage with these truths. How are we to encourage? There's a wide selection of ways. It's just limited by our creativity, but let me offer a few recommendations in line of the other points we've made today. These again are in your outlines, and the first is for us to learn to listen well. Listen well. This may sound a little weird, but I promise you it isn't. You see, the first point about enduring with hope is that we ought to recognize our emotions and grieve when necessary. And I think part of encouraging with truth, comforting with truth, is actually learning to grieve with those who grieve. Learning to grieve with those who grieve. And we will not know who to grieve with, what to grieve about, or how to grieve with them unless we cultivate the art of listening well. Romans 12 verse 15, I love this verse. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice. If someone is celebrating a win, celebrate with them. But weep with those who weep. If someone is in the valley of darkness, be with them. And we will not be able to do any of these things unless we know what is going on in the hearts of people around us. If we want to be good encouragers, then we need to first be good listeners. Now, there are plenty of resources about how to be better listeners, active listening, open posture, empathy, all the rest of it. But perhaps just for today, we ought to learn to listen without rushing to speak. Learn to listen without rushing to speak. I don't know about you, but I have this terrible habit of listening to someone spill out their hearts, and even before they finish their sentence, I already know what I want to say in return. It might be because part of my job is just to keep speaking. I have this chronic um, problem with wanting to speak. You see, at this point, I'm actually not listening. I'm just waiting for my turn to speak. These two things are different, isn't it? 
listening and waiting to speak. Part of, a why, part of why our society feels so disjointed and disconnected these days is because we're all talking. Everyone has a social media account. Everyone is on blogs. Everyone has a space to voice out their opinions. We are talking to each other, but we're more so talking past each other. Everyone is speaking, but no one is listening. Listening actually means saying, my dear brother or sister, what you have to say is supremely important to me, and I'm going to give it 100% of my attention. It's saying, I'm not going to pretend to know what you're going to say. I'm not going to pretend like I know what you're going through or what you're feeling. I'm just going to be a set of ears to feel the weight of your pain and concern. Listening well. That's an art that we ought to learn. Connected to listening well is actually leaning in. What does this mean? You know, there is something about people's grief that pushes people around them away. There's a powerful book titled What Grieving People Wish You Knew by Nancy Guthrie. And she writes that one of the hardest things about experiencing loss is that people naturally keep a distance from you. We tend to keep a distance from grieving people because we feel like it's a bit awkward. Uh, we, we don't know what to say. It, and, and quite frankly, their grief makes us uncomfortable. Now, I'm not going to comment on the legitimacy of any of these actions, but I want to say that true encouragement requires us to lean into people, to be with them in their stages of darkness wherever they are. I remember asking a very senior minister once, he probably 50 years in ministry already, and I asked him what he wishes he knew when he was a minister back when he was in his 20s. And he said something along the lines of, and I quote, I've never regretted walking too closely with people. I've only regretted standing too far away. I have never regretted walking too closely with people. I have only regretted standing too far away. <laughs> he goes on to say, if you lean in too close and people don't like it, they can just um, gently, kindly ask you for space. But if you keep a distance, you will never know the sound of their heartbeat. You will never know what they need. Leaning in well in order to listen well. But thirdly, and this is so critical, lift up. Lift up. The danger of exclusively listening well and leaning in is that we may end up Enabling people's ungodly wallowing. I said it again. The danger of exclusively listening well and leaning in is that we may end up enabling people's ungodly, sometimes sinful, wallowing. Now again, I want to stress the importance of listening well and leaning in as an expression of our encouragement. But ultimately, church, what we need is the hope of the gospel. People around us need their eyes lifted up to see and await the return of Christ. Then is when everything will be okay. And they need to be encouraged with truth. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. We all need someone to say to us, Elliot, because Jesus is coming back again, everything is going to be okay. We speak these truths to one another. These truths that we've examining in our passage to lift our eyes to God in whom all hope is found. Because this is true. Because Jesus is coming back again. Everything is going to be okay. Late last year, there was a particular evening where I went to bed earlier than I usually do. And instead of lying on um, a dry pillow, uh, I was leaning on uh, sheets that are drenched in tears. Um, Sherilyn walked in, my wife walked into the room to see if I was okay, and she started chatting with me. 
and I started pouring out my life to her with some of the things that I was struggling and wrestling with and wrestling before God and pleading and praying, and it just seemed like God was silent. It was one of the darkest nights of my life to date so far. And she just did such a great job of just listening and encouraging and leaning in. And all she said to me, and this is where I came up with the tagline for today's sermon is, everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. And I used to hate that saying. Because in our world, we say that, but we don't know the foundation for why everything's going to be okay. It's a pad answer that we give to people, and at best, it's just, um, just licking their wounds. At worst, it's selling false hope. If someone is going through grief and you tell them everything is going to be okay, why? Why is everything going to be okay? What is my foundation for believing in such a thing? But that particular night, Sherilyn so helpfully reminded me from Scripture, Jesus is coming back again. Your hurts will be healed. Your scars will be smoothed out. Your tears will be wiped away. And your joy will be eternal. Our hope is in the return of Christ and the future resurrection. Because Jesus is coming back again. Everything's going to be okay. We encourage one another with this truth. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you. We live in a world that feels so hopeless. In a world where we've tried everything, really. We've tried to control. We've spent money. We've expended all of our energies to try to make things right. And and still, it feels like there's no hope. And we thank you that you invite us to run to you. You invite us to turn to you. Sometimes you strip us of all the things that we build our confidence on to show them that we are building our house on sinking sand in order that we may turn our gazes towards you. We thank you for this hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. My Lord and God, I especially pray for many in our community during this season who are struggling in the ways that We can't even imagine. Chronic physical hurt that follows them. Every corner that they turn. Every waking moment. Sometimes even every sleeping moment. This pain follows them. We pray for many who are suffering from heartache. From emotions that weigh on their shoulders in ways that they struggle to wake up every morning because it's too much. And they just wonder, is there an end to this? Could this just all be over? We feel like we're just hanging by a loose thread. And especially during this Father's Day, we we pray for fathers and many parents who um, are struggling in their relationships at home. And, And people like us who are outsiders, we look in and we, we can't imagine what it's like. And so gracious God, we ask that through the preaching of your word today, but also through each of us here at Grace Point whom, who can encourage with truth, we ask that you would help us to lift up their eyes to the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Nothing else saves. No one else saves. Nothing else can give us the same degree of hope and joy that our hearts so desperately long for a need. And so, Lord and God, we pray that you will impress these truths into our hearts and enable them to shape our emotions so that we can, in the words of our passage today, grieve, but not like the rest of humanity who have no hope. We thank you that because Jesus is coming back, everything is going to be okay. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for your great and wonderful and glorious purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing um, in response to the sermon.
the Apostles' Creed is called the Apostles' Creed not because it was produced by the Apostles of Jesus themselves, but because it contains a brief summary of the teachings of the Apostles as contained in the Gospels in the New Testament. So together with Christians since the first century and generations who have affirmed what we believe, we together affirm our faith as expressed in the Apostles' Creed. So let's say it together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God, um, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead on the third day. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father, from there he was come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I hope that after today we can recite i believe in the holy spirit the holy catholic church the communion of saints forgiven the sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting with a greater degree of comfort confidence hope and joy let's receive god's blessing today the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace our Lord and God, we thank you that you are not a God who asks us to get our life together or get our lives on track. No, you have come for us, for broken people such as us, and you have come to make us whole. We thank you for blessing us with your word today, and we ask that we would be able to be a blessing to our city and our world this week, wherever we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, your week has begun. Uh, go and love and serve God's people in God's world, and we'll see you again next week.
Thank you.